In this segment, I would like to address the differences between ecumenical and interreligious dialogue. Let us begin by asserting the basic point that while ecumenism applies primarily to Christians of different churches and communities, calling them to visible unity, interreligious dialogue seeks mutual understanding and the common good between persons of different religious traditions. Now, let us consider each of these in turn. On the one hand, as stated in the Second Vatican Council's decree on ecumenism, Unitatis Red Integratio, the restoration of unity among all Christians is one of the principal concerns of the Council, and this precisely because Christ the Lord founded one church and one church only. And yet, the fact remains that there are many Christian communities that, while understanding themselves to be true followers of the Lord, continue to live as separated and divided brethren. Such disunity in the body of Christ is simply unacceptable. Indeed, this separation between the Catholic Church and other ecclesial communions openly contradicts the will of Christ, scandalizes the world, and damages that most holy cause, the preaching of the gospel to every creature. Ecumenism is, therefore, both our work as Christians and, above all, God's gift. It is our work because, as the Catholic Catechism teaches, Christ always gives his church the gift of unity, but the church must always pray and work to maintain, reinforce, and perfect the unity that Christ wills for her. It is God's gift because it originates in and finds its consummation with the Lord himself who, on the eve of his passion, beseeched his Father with the airily prescient prayer, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be one with us, so that the world may know that you have sent me. There are many requirements of Christians who seek to respond to the prayer of Jesus. Namely, we must strive for conversion of heart, common knowledge of other Christians' policies and practices, ecumenical formation, dialogue, and collaboration. But perhaps one aspect of these I would like to highlight above all else is the singular importance of prayer, that is, the necessity to pray with and for our separated brethren. This practice is an intrinsic part of coming together in Christ who by grace can help us both to overcome our differences and draw us together in our similarities. As John Paul II said in his encyclical, Ut Unum Sint, if Christians, despite their divisions, can grow ever more united in common prayer around Christ, they will grow in the awareness of how little divides them in comparison to what unites them. On the other hand, we have interreligious dialogue. But why, one might ask, does the Catholic Church engage in such dialogue with people of other religions? As Pope John Paul II put it, From the beginning, Christian revelation has viewed the spiritual history of man as including, in some way, all religions, thereby demonstrating the unity of humankind with regard to the eternal and ultimate destiny of man. The Church sees the promotion of this unity as one of its duties. As with ecumenical dialogue, there are distinguishing marks or types of interreligious dialogue. Four of these are elucidated by the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. First, there is the dialogue of life, where people strive to live in an open and neighborly spirit, sharing their joys and sorrows their human problems and preoccupations. Next, there is the dialogue of action, in which Christians and others collaborate for the integral development and liberation of people. Thirdly, there is the dialogue of theological exchange, where specialists 
seek to deepen their understanding of their respective religious heritages and to appreciate each other's spiritual values. And last of all, there is the dialogue of religious experience, where persons rooted in their own religious traditions share their spiritual riches, for instance, with regard to prayer and contemplation, faith and ways of searching for God. In addition, interreligious dialogue proceeds from the Church's conviction that our human reason has the ability to know God, and so we ought to strive to speak of Him to all people and with all people. In the Second Vatican Council's Declaration on the Relation of the Church to Non-Christian Religions, Nostra Itate, we read that there is found among different peoples a common quest for meaning that originates in the ever-restless human heart, a quest for meaning and purpose, for an answer to sin and suffering, for a lifting of the veil that separates our finite and transient lives here with that shadowy world of infinite beauty and life we call heaven. Indeed, the Council Fathers point out in this all-important document that such questioning amongst peoples of all religions often leads to a certain awareness of a deep religious sense that culminates in a recognition of a supreme being, and to this extent, they go on to say, the Catholic Church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these religions. And while she, the Church, is duty-bound to proclaim Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and in whom God reconciled all things to himself, still the Church urges her sons and daughters to enter with prudence and charity into discussion and collaboration with members of other religions. In other words, since the Second Vatican Council, the Catholic Church has made it her duty to cast a wide net of dialogue that includes peoples of all religions. Interreligious dialogue intends to establish deeper levels of understanding and respect, trust and friendship, which in turn, as we have seen since the Council, lead to solidarity in the promotion of religious freedom and cooperation on a variety of social issues in the public square. As Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI said, I invite all religious people to view dialogue not only as a means of enhancing mutual understanding, but also as a way of serving society at large. By bearing witness to those moral truths which we hold in common with all men and women of goodwill, religious groups will exert a positive influence on the wider culture and inspire neighbors, co-workers, and fellow citizens to join in the task of strengthening the ties of solidarity. Overall, Though the Church understands ecumenical and interreligious dialogue as having distinct goals, both nevertheless share a common denominator, namely the absolute need to strive for greater understanding and respect, which produces an environment of trust that leads to ever greater cooperation and unity.